welcome our gemological members. Thank you so much for coming out on this horrible afternoon and with the sudden COVID lockdown that we have for the three days. I would like to introduce Nicola Herbert to present to us himself, his passion, gorgeous collection of gemstones, and uh, Nicola will tell us how the afternoon will proceed. So enjoy and welcome. Thanks. Okay, so um, that talk is going to be about the mineralogy of the gem bearing marble of Southeast Asia, um, a journey from Lukian to Mogok. Um, so that talk is going to cover some of my personal background, what it's like to prepare a field exhibition, um, especially all the um, legal and logistical issues that one may face um, during such an expedition. Then um, a more scientific description of the reason behind similar uh, mineralogy between those two places um, through structural settings and age, host rock, geochemistry and pyrogenesis and fluid inclusions, pressure, temperature and all that information we can gather from fluid inclusions. And then um, a part dedicated to kind of an inside view, um, more of a social aspect of what it's like to visit this place and witness traditional mining practices and um, some social and financial interactions where when you have to collect samples uh, with the local miners. Um, so, who am I? Um, so, that no, that's all right. That, no, that's all right. Okay. Um, so, um, Nicolas Hébert, as said before, um, French, in which case people didn't keep up my accent yet. Um, geologist. I'm working uh, for Dalgaranga Gold Mine right now, so 80 kilometers west of Mad Magnet, the Yilgarn Krasnum. Um, I've been there for a year and a half now. And um, because WA is one of the best places on earth to be a geologist because there are so many mines. So I was born in Chartres, which is a, a middle town located 80 kilometers west of Paris. Um, so it's very, very flat, as you might able to see here. So lots of very rich history, but not so much when it comes to rocks because it's a boring sedimentary terrain with very, very few outcrops. And you'd very much rather enjoy limestone and clay because that's all there is. Um, so after high school, I went to Paris to do two years of undergrad um, or class preparatoire, as we say, say that, to go for um, a national prepare for a national wide exam that um, allows you to go in the uni you want or, or not, depending on your results. And that's how I moved to Nancy. Um, and I was much closer to the Vosges Massif where I could prospect for lots of copper, bismuth, barium, fluorine, uh, small scale deposits, but quite interesting, any of them. And then it was really uh, just a a few kilometers away from Germany too, so um, very interesting um, field trips to Clara Mine in the Schwarzwald, lots of interesting micromineralogy up there, and Mendich in Eiffel, where you get the, the Hawaiian, you may have heard of before. Um, so interesting trips uh, when I was at uni. Uh, sadly, um, these areas are not really great in terms of high crops, and during winter time you can't, you can't do as many trips as you want. Um, so I was growing with um, frustration and I started watching more and more videos on YouTube, especially about um, field geology and through the GIA um, field geology channel at the time that was still online, um, that was directed by Vincent Pardieu. And that got me hooked. And so what was the next step? Um, uni required me to um, do some internships. I already had done an internship for the first year uh, at the CRPG, which is the Center for Research about Petrographic and Geochemical Analysis, but it's more about deep earth and planetary science and stuff like that. Even though we've got some researchers which are focusing on gems like uh, Gaston Giuliani, you may have heard of him. Um, and um, I thought that maybe doing an internship with Vincent would have been a good idea. Um, and so, Seeing that a researcher from my uni, um, so Gaston Giuliani, was featured in one of his, his video uh, in Mogok, was actually the trigger for me. 
and that's the lab internship I was telling you about. So I was working on non-diamantiferous um, kimberlite, and I saw some some. This is um, actually a, a sapphire or corundum because it's, it's non-gem from nickelgite from kimberlite uh, xenolith from Yakutia. So I was already um, studying sapphires from the very far end because I was mostly interested in sulfurs at the time. But that enabled me to um, meet Gaston and then all the members of the lab, which was how I got into sending an application letter to Vincent. But I had no, no positive answer, and then I did an uh, internship at the Ministry of Mines in France, which was good too. Um, so some more field trips in France, um, which are only available during uh, August, because otherwise, just like the art crops are covered with snow. Then some more trips, uh, more fossil oriented uh, in Spitsbergen, so halfway between Norway and the uh, North Pole, uh, where I documented um, this for a, a Swiss museum in Fribourg. And the exhibition is actually taking place right now, if you can go in Fribourg and visit this. Um, all about Devonian fossils, so very similar to the Gogo formation we've got up north in WM. And, um, and then I did the same. Uh, Another expedition in Lusk, uh, Wyoming, for a uh, German museum and with uh, national geographic coverage for the media. And that's actually my specimen here, rough in the in the in situ. And then after preparation, you can see the teeth, which is about that, that long. So quite quite impressive stuff. Anyway, and so all of these expeditions prepared me to making a, a much greater, much longer one. After I was I graduated, and so then I took kind of a gap here um, and visited a few places in Asia. Um, so I visited different um, localities, so Chantaburi, uh, Ratanakiri, um, um, Wakesai for the sapphires here. I visited um, um, the aquamarine deposit there in the Kowloon mines. Um, but what I'm going to be talking mostly about today is uh, the Lukian area and Mogok area, um, because that's where I spend the most time and I got the most samples from. Um, so about that trip, obviously it involves reading a lot um, because you want to know what to expect, um, what not to miss going there. And um, you're not going to reinvent the wheel. So. Um, Knowing what has been done already is, is very precious information, and now it's so easy to access papers. You go online, Sci-Hub, and then you get all the research you can ever bring off. Um, that also goes into making a research not in just journal papers, but also Facebook and Instagram. As crazy as it sounds, uh, that's where the regular miners are publishing what they find. That's where people um, are, are speaking about deposit in a more casual way, and you get much fresh information going through those kind of social media. Um, so it was actually quite useful going there and then checking what's happening because for instance, um, all the documentation about Wexi Sapphire Deposits said so that was a 2012 um, paper from Hughes and no one has said that had this might not close. So I had to go there physically and see, oh, it's closed and there's nothing less to be seen. I found the place. Anyway, um, and so the idea I got in the back of my head was I wanted to document the best I could my trips in the different gem mining areas so I would kind of have a portfolio on my Instagram. So then when I would be ready enough, I could then contact uh, a key field geologist, geologist um, that would be able to give me um, hints about how to get in Myanmar and Mogok because it's really, really hard to go there if you don't know how. Um, so as I was telling you, we're going to focus in the northern part of Vietnam in Lu Hien because there are just so many different mineral species coming from there. Um, you get all the those BGY sapphires there, which are not going to be the subject of the talk. All we care about is that shear zone there. And even in that shear zone, we're going to separate uh, the area which is really marble horses because the other one has a kind of metamorphism which is more nice sediment um, assemblage, which are not the subject of that talk. Um, so going to Myanmar was um, um, kind of um, an issue because even though I was in Laos, I couldn't 
cross that Lao Burmese border. Only the nationals can. Foreigners can't. So I had to figure out another way to go, and I was on, on the budget. So the plane was not an option. And um, actually, that place, Hedetek, is very seldomly used, um, but does work. And it's just near the um, Kanchanaburi uh, Sapphire Mines, which are no longer active, and they only mine peoples and quartz gravel from there. Um, but that was worth a visit anyway. Um, and then went up north from there to uh, Dawei, Brangun, Mandalay, and then finally uh, Mogok. Um, so as you can see here, that's a, a road that has um, proper grading on only one side because it's too expensive to do it on the two sides, and that's the way uphill. So when you need more traction, you get that on the way in, but you don't get that on the way down. Just like it's saving resources wherever you can, because um, that's that's requiring energy when you don't have manpower, when you don't have the resource to build proper roads. So it's yeah, the means of locomotion can be a bit a bit weird. Um, you got um, the scooter is a very convenient way to access the remote areas, even though sometimes it's not really like the, the safest place. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, so you get um, uh, a leech? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, that, that's a common thing to expect in the, um, in the uh, Vietnamese jungle. Um, next time I bring some propaganda boots, but um, I didn't know at the time. And so, um, yeah, that's what happens. And no, that's, that's what it is. Um, you have to, during these trips, you have to cope with electricity shortage, which are very, very common in, in Myanmar, not so much in, 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 Burma, in, in Vietnam, but um, you would see often on the bus stations, street vendors that offer those Chinese um, extra batteries because they, they actually find that business of providing electricity to the people that need them because those trips are like seven, nine hours long to go for a few hundred kilometers away. Um, and and because you don't have consistent power, that's making the trip more difficult because then you have to think, oh, I'm going, I want to access that information. So I need to save a paper version of that because I won't be able to check online because my smartphone is going to be dead by that time. Or I need to recharge the batteries for my, my camera or stuff like this. So it's, there's lots of planning that as a Westerner, we not, we might not think about in the first place because, um, the reality of the field is, yeah, it's, it, it's what it is. And those electro generators are noisy and don't always work even when you need them. So that's what it is. Um, um, so crossing borders, as I was telling you, I could not directly go from Lao to Myanmar. And even if I wanted to cross here, which is legal, um, that part of the road is illegal for foreigners. So you are stuck there unless you take a plane to go to Mandalay or Yangon. So uh, the most common way to transit from Thailand uh, to Burma by foot or, or car or whatever is um, at Mysot. But what I did on the way in was to go to this place and then join, uh, join Mogok, which is where all of these waypoints are stored. Um, so that was the map of Burma as per the French government when I went there the first time. So you can see that Mogok is just in that orangey um, corner uh, surrounded by uh, formerly unadvised area. And with the current situation, I've got an updated map. And now I think it's in orange uh, and the red is the red. Um, so uh, about that place here, my thoughts, um, I want you to know uh, what it's known for. Um, which is um, one of the most common for smuggling gems. That's the most common way for smuggling gems. So you get here the, um, the river, which is defining border or was defining because you see that the meanders have changed now. And so the historical border is quite different from the current one anyway. And so that's Thailand. You can see that that's typewriting. And that's uh, Miawadi on the other side, uh, which is a Burby space. And that's a friendship bridge. And if you zoom in, in that friendship bridge, um, so you get the, um, the customs on one side and the other side. And there, 
you got some boats and they go from one way to the other one. Mm -hmm. Because the Burmese don't, uh, and the, the, the Vietnamese, uh, the, the Thai, they don't have to show the passport every time because they are neighboring countries. And so there's lots of exchanges that doesn't go through the, um, the proper custom process and evades the, um, yeah, the, the regular way. So about the, the export laws and uh, customs. So that's going to be covering Myanmar only because I haven't done any research for Vietnam. Um, so it's uh, legally only allowed to export Polish colored gemstones, which is uh, not a good um, good thing for me uh, because I like mineral specimens like, like that. Um, but that's that's what it is. Um, and theoretically, foreigners, buyers should always request a receipt from the shop so they can declare to the customer the value of what they bought. And when you actually buy from miners directly, how do you get a receipt? Um, so there is normally a 15% commercial tax and 25% income tax on profit for the larger scale enterprise. But for gemstones, the proper taxation is normally 50%. Which is huge. Right. It it's huge. Um, so as I was as uh, as I said, um, when you are buying in local markets, it's it's making very hard to to get um, a proof of purchase uh, stating the, the value. And as a result, lots of the exported gemstones are undervalued um, for customs. And um, even though Myanmar has opened, that's from like a few years ago, uh, to international trade, um, as it's still in the process of becoming a, a country under development, um, there are still inconsistencies between what the law says and how the law is actually applied. Um, and, um, and it's estimated that about 70% of the gemstone trading activities are off the record. Um, so, the Burmese law do not limit the quantity of gemstones that are sold to foreigners. That's quite common to be offered to. Uh, I was offered that quite quite commonly. Uh, I didn't get to get to see this because I'm not a large enough buyer. Um, um, and something which is um, getting more and more popular now is like online trading, especially in Mandalay where you get lots of um, Chinese sellers that have their customers and they would just share on their social media um, what brokers bring in. And then that's mostly for the chain market. But um, when, during my last trip in, in Mogok, I start seeing um, dealers doing that. So sometimes they even have a, a, a cooling circuit under the phone because the phone is overheating by taking pictures and videos and stuff. And so they've got the whole setup and then all the, the brokers are queuing to, to show them the stones and and that's a, an efficient way of, of doing business, which is um, which is what it is and it, it, it's, it's growing now. Um, so um, that's what I could find on the government website a few years ago about the um, legal taxes. Um, that's if you are buying from the um, Myanmar Gem Emporium. So then you've got about 30% taxes on rubies. Um, sapphires are about the same. But um, if you are concerned about mineralogical specimen, which was more my cup of tea, it fell, it, um, it fell into that category, which is normally like 5% tax. So depending on what you interpret as being, uh, a mineral specimen and piece of rough and the crystal and half cut. So it, 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 there's lots of borderline to be interpreted. And how come bees have a tax and not be allowed for exports if they are actually present? No, it's, it's weird. And 5% is actually lower than the export tax for whales, dolphins, porpoises, manatees, and dugong and seals and sea lions and walruses that you can eat because they are under meat offers uh, as primates and other stuff. So that's facts. Um, 
So that's um, a piece of information I found from on the, the GIT website in Thailand. Um, and that's a map from Hughes, which is illustrating um, the smuggling ways of gemstone out of Burma. Um, so that's the, the way I told you about, where the, there is a river crossing, and as long as the stones are on the other side of the river, then they are Thai, and sometimes they are called Thai gemstones, because yeah. they are Thai. Um, and that's why Mysore has quite a decent-sized market with mostly Burmese material. Um, but there is um, also Tachilik and my Hong Song, which are two ports for um, smuggling. Um, these areas are um, controlled by independent groups, and yeah, there, there's not much more to be said about that because as a foreigner, you can't really access this place and, and tell what's going on there. But that's some of the known um, ways of getting uh, gemstone out. And it's estimated that 70% of the stones go off the radar. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk now about how um, taxes are paid on gemstones. Um, you have to have a, an indicative value of that gemstone is worth 10. I'm going to put 50 tax on it and it's going to pay me 5. But is that worth 10? Is it 20? Is it So because it, it's hard to put a price on, there is uh, always a bit of tea money involved into making a lower estimation of what the production is like so that then the tax applies first and then uh, the real value of the um, of the product is then exposed and that's where the, the shareholders, because most of the time the production is actually shared among um, different mine owners, um, it's done. So um, I have visited a place where I'm going to show the pictures uh, just after this one, where as per what information I could gather, um, basically there would be like 20% tax on what they found. And based on the first estimation, which is like, say, it's worth 100, 100 bucks or whatever. And then the real value might be around twofold, a bit more, uh, which is decreasing the tax back to about 10% of what it was originally. Um, and then, so the profits is actually split against, um, like about a, about a quarter is bamboo expenses just to make the structure of the, the pits stable enough to go there and the electricity the pit is deep enough and there is some electrical assist to um to recover the gravel and then the pay of the miner is actually less than the electricity bill um the chief miner gets a bit more about 12 percent and the, the royalty for the landowner is actually the biggest with being about a third um and so that's uh taking example in that mine and that mine which was um, a square pit, which is a very typical way of accessing uh, the gem bearing gravel, about like 10 meters deep, maybe a, a bit more. Um, so they call that living practice. Um, this was a month old when I visited it and they hadn't reached bedrock yet. Um, so it took them about 20 seconds to, um, to recover the, the bucket. And so that was about like 300 buckets a day. And there was a team of five miners three down the hole and two on the top. And as you can see, this one is 100% renewable because you don't have a single use of electricity. Uh, it's just manual labor. Um, so that's what the pit looks like from above. So some bamboo and wood constructions, some leaves from uh, eton question, so to avoid like the water leaking and and that's a, a deeper one, which was just on the side uh, where you had uh, untagged electrical circuits with um, a fairly straightforward indication of um, how the motor did work. And yeah, you don't even need to be literate to operate that. So um, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, so the name of that mine was Roof Rock, um, so Pyok Moy. And um, I was offered some of samples of magnetite that were found in the gravel. And they know that, so basically they're putting all the gravel out. And when they start having positive magnetite signal, they know that they are going to be in the good layer. And it's more likely that they're going to have spinel. And actually, this one has a mix between spinel and rubies. Um, and yeah. And just after that picture was taken, 
they pulled out um, a concretion, a, a stalactite that they really enjoyed displaying as ornament. Um, and that was very magical, quite interesting anyway. Um, and so in that instance, they were stockpiling the dirt because when I visited that place in, last, in February last year, um, the, um, the mining license hadn't expired yet, but were expected to expire in the coming months. And so they were building up the stockpile as much as they could and to process it later on, uh, once it would not be legal anymore to mine. And actually they also were lacking water to wash the gravel anyway. So um, yeah, that, that was the idea behind that. So you can see the, the scale of things. It has nothing to compare with the Roman uh, proper mine site in the very way. So that picture here, is um, the auction which is held annually, was held annually um, in Myanmar by the Myanmar Gem Enterprise, which is a, a state-owned um, company that is both issuing the license, uh, creating the regulation about the mine places and has some commercial activities. So it's operating the mines, some of the mines that they award the license to. Um, and um, that's the only way to buy uh, from the government mines um, at these auctions. And if you've seen on the media that uh, the US or the EU have um, condemned uh, the recent uh, junta by stopping exports, this is what is targeted. That's not the, the small scale mining, because there is little way of controlling what's happening there. Um, that's these events. Um, so if you want to know more about these events, um, so if you want to attend one and you want to buy some gems, you've got to pay a deposit of 10 grand euros. So it's going to be, yeah, um, it's going to be, I don't know, about 16,000 16, Australian. And for JD is double. Um, so quite quite important. And the reason for that is that they are dealing with massive quantities and massive budgets. How often do they do the markets? It's normally once a year, as far as in this too. Yeah. And just so you have an idea of figures, uh, the J market there is like orders of magnitude greater than that of selling rubies and sapphires. Obviously, they make profit both ways. So that's the, the, the Myanmar journal. And this, I think it was uh, two years ago, they, sell, they sold 500 um, million uh, euros worth of jade and the, um, the gemstones were worth 370,000. So you get like 500 million and 370,000, um, like all this magnitude. So um, yeah, boycotting jade is actually more powerful than boycotting gemstone if you really want to boycott. Um, and actually, um, it was mostly leftovers from the previous exhibitions um, because there was some, some suspension of extraction. Um, I put some of those slides uh, online, so if you want actually to read through the articles. Um, yeah. Um, so then you get the question, who do you want to buy from? Uh, you can either buy from these cells, which are going to be... Um, influence like providing some benefits to the army and the government um, and you could also buy directly at the source which then is not properly legal because you've not used the proper legal channel but you know, you know that the money is going to be helping the proper inhabitants of the land and the villagers which happen to be miners when they are not on paddy fields or grain crops um, so that's a picture of um, Chokya Tat, which is located on the very western side of the, the Mogok Valley, on the other side of Chapin. And um, so that was an army-owned and operated mine, uh, which is named Yadane Kadekada. And I visited this place two years ago, uh, three, two and a half years ago. And so basically, from the look at there, you could see there was a jig, and there were about 20, 25 people tops villagers from that place that were um, recovering the, the leftovers and doing the canase from the leftovers. And I was able to buy some of the production and I had millimeter sized stones because the screening 
was quite efficient actually, and all the major gemstones were taken and would have actually been sold at the major event I, I showed you. But then uh, the laws in Myanmar changed and um, the licenses expired. And the license for that place expired too, even though it was owned by the government, um, it was not licensed to operate anymore. And so when I returned a year afterwards, um, the villagers had taken back possession of the places and I'll show some pictures later on of the before and after. Um, it's very close to um, uh, yeah, a weird anomaly with get um, weird species that I come to that later on. Um, yeah, so that's what I was telling you about. Um, very, very small stones and you get the jig here with the operators, the controller, and then you get 20, maybe 30 people tops uh, scouting the, in the, the remaining uh, the tailings. And I think that the blue shirt lady was actually there and I caught her by the time she was back, uh, back on the hill uh, to buy that production just for reference. And that's how it looked like a year, a year later. So you add all of these tarpaulins, uh, fruits, um, on the ground and nearly under each of them, you have, um, a square pit, uh, going in between the cast and, um, yeah, much more activity because all the village that you could see here have actually been moving there because they went from like 30 miners to a few hundreds. Um, yeah, mineral market. Um, it used to be very crowded, but um, now because of COVID, it's looking much more like that. Um, by the way, Till now is the telecommunication operator from Norway that had to shut down his activity recently uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but it used to look like these uh, brokers circulating and showing buyers um, what they had um, for sale. And actually it's quite a funny process to be harassed with like literally 50 hands showing you stuff. Um, and you have to learn to say no very quickly, okay, otherwise you can get very overwhelming quicker. Um just sorry Nicholas, that question is most of the stock natural, not not synthetic? Is there are they trying to palm off some uh, of the thing is like I was mostly buying specimens. Okay. So that's not something um I was too much concerned about because I was mostly targeting specimen matrix or loose crystals like you know like that kind of um yes um, spinners. Yes. Um you can have imitation of the octahedrons, uh, which are repolished. So it's like they're using a proper natural crystal and then they are repolishing it to make it look like um, an octahedron because it attracts best mm -hmm. price. But um, I haven't, because the thing is like, if you start buying rough, people see that you buy rough, they are providing you rough. If you start buying minerals in matrix, more minerals in matrix come. If I had started buying um, cut stones, then I would have been offered more cut stones. And maybe some people would have yeah. tried to, to, to give me some mm. Madagascar material or something. Um, but that didn't concern me too much because I was not in buying cut stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's back in Vietnam. You get Kong Troy mine in the background. And I put that picture there because that's where you actually park the motorbike before hiking there. And that lady is actually the, the owner of the, the house under which we park cars. And so you don't have a pay and display, but <laughs> she's got some stones to sell. I've got a motorbike to park. And <laughs> that's a good deal. Um, so yeah, that's the mayor of the town and of Anfu and some of his son examining um, uh, the production which has been uh, taken down from the miners in the hills back to the village and you see he's a smart guy because he actually has gum boots um, which I should have had. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the um, larger scale mines that I was um, that I had, I had a chance to visit uh, so that's a Kyok Mori Ruby mine um, so that's a stockpile you can see it's quite coarse material it's because in that uh, building here, it's going to get crushed and hopefully all the uh, rubies, that's a ruby mine, are going to be um, 
freight and then collected. And so I witnessed um, the process of um, yeah, transferring all the material and it's done by these buckets. So every of these single stones have been collected in the buckets because um, the entrance of the mine is actually um, quite shallow. And um, it's used to employ two thousand people at the time before I, I showed up, but I couldn't get a proper estimation of how many workers there were at the time of my visit, but I saw the rice cooker and the plate is seven, seven to eight people, and there are that many, so it's like maybe 200 workers underneath, but yeah, I, I never get to know really. Um, so thanks to U Chin to allow me to visit that place. And it's actually quite interesting because there is a sign um, which is posted on one of the buildings where you know how much every employee earns. So there are not too many categories on the year. Here you get the assistant operator, the manager, and the manager. And so the Vietnamese chart is the, um, the local currency. And so that's <laughs> how much it converted last year when I did the talk for Minoru Society of Western Australia. And because of the recent event, the uh, Kiat versus uh, Australian dollar um, has changed significantly. So now it's back to uh, about five grand a year for an assistant operator. Um, and yeah, I haven't adjusted all the prices uh, of the incomes, but you get a, a rough idea. And so everyone knows what they earn, and that's what it is. And that's uh, just the, the Austrian barrier to Myanmar chat. And you can see that um, it's not the Austrian getting stronger, it's actually the Myanmar chat getting weaker. Uh, but um, yeah, there is quite a, a strong difference. Um, it's what it is. Um, Nicholas, with the um, the previous slide you had with the, the oh no, sorry, the, the mine where they were, that one, where they were going to be crushing the larger pieces <coughs> into smaller to find the rubies, I think you said. So you never find big ruby crystals? I mean... There are, there are big rubies like this, but um, they are hidden. So they'd get crushed, so the big ones would get... No, so, so you... You actually different. You have different steps of crushing, yeah. and you have to check at the different steps. Okay. So where does the water come from? Is it water? Um, so the, there, there is not need of much water there. The, the only water they use is actually to help um, discard the tailings out. Um, uh, water is actually most of an issue because you need to dewater the um, the pits, oh, the, okay. the the tunnels, really. So. Um, but otherwise there's not much use of water there. So that's the, that's the elevator for the bags. Um, and then that's the crushing units uh, with different crushers. And then you see the size of the, the tailings is about that, that big and then gets discarded. And I asked if I could search for the tailings and uh, I was granted that authorization. And all I could find was two malinite, uh, some marble with graphite specs. And basically they, they are very good at picking up the rubies. Uh, it's, they are doing the job well. The pile was very well sorted. Um, okay, so um, if you want to go to Mogok, you'll have to have a mandatory guide. That's a government um, requirement. And um, I did most of my trips with uh, Kinsaki Tin, which was, um, I was actually her first ever customer. Um, and that was great. So you've got the, um, um, Chupiatat um, Pagoda just there, and then that's the, the deposit at the bottom of the village that used to be operated by the army, as I told you, but then uh, was taken over by the villages. And um, you also need a special permit, which is um, expensive and hard to obtain. You have to, to wait for at least like two weeks to get it. So yeah, you can't show up to Mogok and expect to see the stuff. It's much easier in Vietnam. You go there whenever you want, no requirements. Um, that's why I'm not covering that side of trip in Vietnam because it's much more straightforward to go there and it's easy to go. Um, using a translator is obviously very nice and um, sometimes it's good not to eat too much at breakfast because um, I happen to be there during the Chinese New Year and as the only foreigner in Mogok at that time, I was invited that event, which was really nice. 
and there was lots of um, dishes that um, I owned. Um, but with a fat breakfast in the first place, it's not not really a good idea. Um, but um, yeah, that was a good a good experience anyway. And um, yeah, that's that's really great to to mix with the people and do their daily life too. Which is like you can't have a hundred percent gemstone trip. You have to feel like what the culture is like there. Um, mm. Sometimes the food is like the papaya salad didn't went very well, um, and um, I would very much advise towards eating cooked stuff. <laughs> um, and then, I t so this, this picture of uh, the can was taken like two years ago. I thought, oh, that's, that's fun, sort of democracy tea. It kind of resonates differently now um, with what happened since February there. Um, and you can see that the democracy goes with that. Uh, um, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so. I cannot make a presentation speaking about Burma not having, not covering what has been taking place. Um, and I've got some Facebook friends which are there, and even though sharing on um, social media is um, can have its drawbacks because then you are leaving some message and then you can be targeted afterwards. Um, that's why stories on Instagram, for instance, by some groups which are maybe not uh, Burmese based, but uh, correcting the signals and then from Thailand or from other places actually putting them online um, has been very strong. And so uh, these are a few screenshots. Um, so I could have covered um, a much wider target than Mogok, but I just decided to restrain what happened in Mogok because then it's even more atrocious what's happened elsewhere. Um, but you see the people are reacting and um, even the monks are reacting. And taking pictures has become so easy now that they are actually documenting what's taking place and and it's much harder to deny um, what's happening there. And their speech is really the only weapon they can have against um, the lack of liberty. Um, so there, that's in Mogok, the message is region in English, so targeting an English speaking audience. Um, yeah. How so, recent are those pictures? Oh, these were um, February, March. Um, I've seen very much less pictures since May. Um, it seems like the censorship um, has been working better. The, um, the fact that they restrained um, access to internet during certain hours of the day, if any, uh, has worked very fine too. People know how to use VPNs but not everyone can pay to have a VPN. And um, and I was discussing with some of my friends, which I see there, and now the police is actually checking their phones on the streets to see what's on the phones. So you can't even have pictures stored on your, it, stored on your, on your phone that you may be sharing not online. Even that is, is, is hard. And um, so when I was preparing that talk, I asked some of my friends, I'm going to have an audience. I don't know how big it's going to be, but it's going to be an audience anyway. Is there anything you want me to say to that audience? And it, it's it's very well into those screenshots already. Um, I was told that story of that uh, being searched in the, in the streets about the content you may have on your phones. And um, I was told to that uh, they fear the night because every night is another time of darkness and they don't know what's happening, um, and the military junta likes to act during the night because it's so much easier. And they've seen atrocities. There's been some bombing. There's been in, like literally in the heart the, in, in Mogok. Um, yeah, capturing people um, regardless of the age. If you yeah, have a target and you can't actually kidnap that target, let's kidnap the wife or the son. And it's 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 hard stuff. Going there, going there. So, yeah. yeah, and that's why you get such massive mobilization. So that's the lake, that's the the Moga Hotel, um, that's the the market just there, and you can see the streets are filled in with people. So it's very hard to be legally allowed to have a drone in Myanmar. You can't uh, if you want to arrive in Mandalay Airport and you've got a drone in your luggage, you don't have a drone in your luggage anymore. It's taken. So these images are quite precious because 
seen from the sky gives you a, a better of the idea of what's going on. And so you get the, the, the main, I forgot the name of that pagoda, but it's the, the, the main one in Mogok with all of the, the treasures and the donations from people. It's like loaded with rubies and it's really, really nice stuff. Um, and then uh, an explicit um, signal from, from people with a market on the background. Um, so this stands for the, the civil disobedience movement, which was um, mostly taking place in February, March, where every worker and um, like for the banks or for uh, our government um, service or teachers, no one was ever working for what they were supposed to do just to block the system because they knew that was the only way to limit the propagation of the disease to some extent. Another view of um, of the main the main area, still the market, the lake, um, Mogok, Hill, uh, Mogok Hotel, and you can see the crowd, and yeah, they just don't want a military coup. Um, they support the the government that was ejected, and a few days later, this is what the same area looked like. So you get policemen, and if you actually look at that screenshot. Um, that's automatic translation, so um, it hurts not to enter the zoo. And they say the animals, they come back, don't enter. So the thing is like, um, these policemen are nicknamed pigs and dogs. I mean, that's the translation I could get from uh, Burma. So that makes sense now, the zoo and animals and stuff. Um, yes, that's what it is. Um, that's one pagoda with a fairly clear signal. I think this one was taken in Mendeley, that doesn't seem much. Um, so now, let's go back to the proper gemology and, and mineralogy and discussing the reasons behind like similar mineralogy in Lukian and, and Vietnam. And, um, and let's get started. So the subject of that talk is going to get restricted to what Giuliani and his co-author have called the tape 2 A2. Um, rubies and, and subsequently spinels, which are displayed on that map in, in, in yellow here. And you can actually see all across uh, Southeast Asia, but even Central Asia. Um, I haven't visited those places, so I'm not going to discuss these, but um, it does happen there. And um, it does happen in Mahenga too, but it's not the exact same kind of marble stuff. So. We're just going to concentrate in Myanmar, so Mogok and Mongshu, and, and Vietnam. Um, that's a fairly one, a fairly recent publication that I would highly recommend reading. So it does make sense to actually speak about these places only, because as you can see on that graph, they are making a single cluster. Um, so that's plotting chromium content versus iron content. And you can see that Mozambique is very distinct to those uh, Burmese uh, and Vietnamese um, marble type deposit, marble type and like type. It's, it's worth a thousand words here. Um, if you go a bit finer in the details, um, so let, let's zoom in just there because, okay, we, we know that the iron content now is a very good discriminator between these and that, but you can still have some heterogeneity in, in the iron content at, at, a, at a low scale. So if you actually having a look at the iron content here, um, you've got that, that heart here of the, the ruby marbles, um, still very similar from Mogok to Lukian, but you see that the gallium of your magnesium ratio is a good indicator to, to separate um, those two populations. Um, and yeah, um, let's, let's move on. So I don't know if you've heard of principal component analysis, but you can do a quite complex statistical analysis where you have a look at all the different um, trace elements and um, then you run the, the algorithm and it's gonna give you some uh, vectors, some factors which are a combination of different weights you give on different elements. And so you're going to make one element matter more than another one. And if you have the proper coefficient, then you can plot these on the graph, and then that's going to discriminate better different origins. And that's what has been done for that study, basically. 
and they found out a, a relationship between iron, chromium, vanadium, magnesium, titanium, gallium, um, among others, um, which if you correct your data set with those coefficients, then you can tell if you're plotting in the given area that this is a marble hostage. How could they tell how much chromium or iron or whatever was in a gem? Oh, you do a LEA CPMS. Okay. You get like proper data sets where you know that it's marble hosted because say like you've got to sample in marbles or that's marble hosted and then you will analyze the, the proper content and then you just plot that. No, thank you. But sometimes it's not good enough because you see you've got like one population, maybe a second population there, maybe a third population here. So even within a bigger group of marble hosted gemstones, you can actually refine that a bit better. And um, if we go back into like um, those kind of diagrams where you are actually getting on the two axis four different signals, you get the iron over magnesium and gallium over magnesium, or actually it's three, three components. Um, or the two axes, you can still uh, differentiate the scan rubies um, to different high vanadium, low vanadium um, rubies. And I do actually have um, a sample. Um, so that's a spinel on scan, that's a proper scan and that's a proper spinel. And until quite recently, that was the only one I own, which, which was related to that kind of scan mineralization, which is in, in the contact with the marble when you get that um, felsic intrusion and that, that, that boundary, you get the, those weird phenomena. Um, but um, very recently, I actually purchased um, that specimen there, which has some rubies and pinite on marble matrix very close to where that pinite and rubies in scar matrix is. And that's a, a sample of green calcite and spinel, and that green calcite is also typical of the, the scan hosted um, deposits. So um, I haven't done that kind of analysis with um, vanadium, chromium, and iron, titanium, magnesium content just to plot them on that graph because I haven't been able to gather my own data yet, but eventually it would be something quite interesting to do on, on those samples. Um, yeah, so this comes from a, a new pinite deposit, which is very close to the older ones. And it's been named Piglet. Piglet, I guess, because of the recent events, I don't know. Um, yeah, more about the geological setting. Um, so the, the marble hosted ruby deposits um, in both of the places I'm going to discuss today share many common structural, mineralogical, and Features and ages, um, so they are in the same metamorphic. Uh, the both of their blocks have been affected by major tectonic events um, during the Cenozoic Indo-Asian collisions. Um, these marble-hosted ruby deposits have been found associated generally with garnet, biotite, sillimanite, or biotite kyanite bearing gneisses and granite. Those gneisses are even more true uh, for the um, um, uh, the East Asian. Um, ruby deposits like um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But you still have some uh, some of these in the um, convoy um, units south of Lukian, southwest of Lukian. And the marble pyrogenesis are mostly consisting of calcite, dolomite, spinels, caprolite, fluorite, margarite, amphibole, chlorite, phosphorite, titanite, graphite, garnet, and pyrite. So um, we'll be able to see these with the, the samples I'll uh, hand afterwards. So in, th in that specimen, for instance, you got um, calcites, rubies, and then you get those mica, which are very likely to be margarite. Um, it's not analyzed yet. And just there, you're going to have some bits of scabrite. Uh, and um, so these deposits are located in the Himalayan mountain belt, which developed during the tertiary collision of the Indian plates northwards of the Eurasian plate. And in Mogok, it's um, quite striking to see how they are actually specially related to granitoid intrusions. And that contains some platform covenant series that underwent hybrid metamorphism. Um, so basically, you can, you can see like pigmentites, minerals, and uh, completely different pyrogenesis very, very close to those marbles deposits. 
and um, in Turin Tong, um, which is like on the west side of Mogok, you actually get all that series of rocks with the skulls in the middle and then the granitic outcrops and then the, the pigmentite in second gene. And it's, it seems that having that granitic intrusion happening afterwards has served as a second baking and has actually improved the purity of um, some gemstones. Um, because uh, a second thermal event um, definitely has played um, a role in in, in uh, the purity of what we've seen so far. Yes, yeah, so all occurrences are located close to major tectonic features uh, formed during the Himalayan orogenesis, uh, directly in suture zone in the Himalayas or shear zone that guided explosion of the Indochina block after the collision of Southeast Asia. I'll show a map later on of Luki and Anu. You, you'll see that um, the local geology is very shared um, on the map. So um, it's going to be more visual there. So geologists quite often like to age a deposit because it's always good to have some datation information. The bad thing is like you can't date rubies themselves because you can't get a signal from aluminium or you can't get a signal from the oxygen isotopes. Those are not good chronometers. Um, but you can date mica because the mica has the elements like potassium that can then be dated um, through the argon-argon method. So if you actually have a mica in the ruby or ruby in the mica, then you can date something. That's also a very good publication I would highly advise really. Um, and so basically all the edges we have are edges from mica, but because of the way the mica was um, associated with ruby, we infer it's actually coming from the ruby. The, the edge is that of the ruby. So it's either a syngenetic growth with rubies, and so the system closes when the rubies stop growing, but it also depends at the closing temperature of phlogopite, um, if it's a phlogopite inclusion, um, because sometimes the closing temperature can be higher than the one we're looking for. Um, the ruby bearing marbles cool through temperatures um, appropriate for argon retention phlogopite about 18 million years old later um, than the proper formation. And so that's the condition of ruby crystallization here. And that's the closure of the argon argon system. So, all of that to say, we've got some uncertainty about that. But we've got some figures. And that's a map. Uh, again, from Garnier, um, that is highlighting the different uh, edges, and Mogok is thought to be about 18 million years old, 17 million years old, which is actually a bit older than the more recent Hunza and Shuma, um, a bit a bit more recent than Yigdalek, and much more recent than Lukian uh, in Vietnam. So 18 million years old and 38 million years old which is, on the scale of things, very recent because you don't have those edges in the Yildgarn Kraton or Yildgarn uh, Kraton and stuff like this in, in here. And the Lukian age was dated from the Zircon, not, not the mica I was mentioning before. Um, and the mineralization actually occurred while there was ductile deformation at the peak metamorphic conditions in the Red River Shear Zone, which is that that shears on here that we're gonna see a bit better just now. So you, you see the, the overall um, uh, structure of the units. So that's the Red River shear zone. And um, that's where Lukian is. And all of the ruby deposits are actually located on 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 that side. And that, that unit here is hosting some other interesting minerals um, like sapphires and other kind of rubies but they are not really marble hosted. They are more like in the gneiss, um, and so I won't talk about them too much um, today. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got some notes about that, but it's, it's getting a bit complex, uh, unless you're very interested about the, the age. Um, once again, I would advise, if you want more to know, to do more, just go back to that geological review by Garnier, and you'll get all the details of the, the different events. Um, um, yeah, that's that's very good job there. Um, 
So another way of figuring that, that's the, the green and the rubies. You might have heard of the John Soul rubies. So like 2.7 billion years old, 600 uh, million years old. And then we've got all of the Himalayan deposits. Um, and the one we are interested in is looking here, Mongshu and Mogok, which are much more recent um, on the scale of things. Can we get a, a picture of that or a copy of that? Is that yeah. All? yeah. Yeah, uh, this one is actually available at uh, Research K, blah, blah, blah. That's the, 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 the article from 2020 with uh, Giuliani, uh, Isabella Pignatelli, um, I was telling you about before. Oh, okay. um, actually, I, I modified this one because they forgot Mogok. Oh. So I, I inserted Mogok there uh, on the original one. You don't, don't have it in Mongshu, it's located there. But yeah. So yeah, I'll forward the, the modified version. Um, they, they actually had scheduled to put Mogok there because it was already a dot at 18. Yeah. But I don't know, they messed up the legend did not appear. Um, so a petrographical analysis showed that the ruby bearing marbles uh, form into the amphibolite faces, um, which means it's like between 600 and 790 degrees, which is quite a large ballpark. So they, there is actually a way of getting more precise. Um, so that's the silimanite deposits, and uh, we have some silimanite in in, um, in Mogok uh, that I'll show you later on. Um, yeah, so that's a good indicator that we are around that that line, but um, there is a need to refine how far on that line we are, and um, that's the specimen I'm going to show you later on with a very nice pure prism from blue to uh, pale colorless, uh, just based on the orientation. It's, um, yeah, so there is a, a way to constrain the, that pressure temperature, um, which is on the fluid inclusions. Um, and basically, that's still referring to Garnier's paper. Um, and that's her result here. Um, so based on the, the fluid inclusions, they, they, they trapped in and nice. Um, so just showing the results, not the, the science behind acquiring the, the results. That's the, 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 the conditions between 620, 670 degrees and 2.6, 3.3 kilobars. And um, when you actually analyze the, the whole rock and you look for the aluminum content in the calcite and the chromium content in the calcite and the vanadium content in the calcite. There is enough of these to actually make the rabies. You don't have to infer the presence of another extra source for um, aluminum. There is already enough impurities of aluminum in the calcite. It's sub-pure, it's not pure enough, but that's, that's sub-pure which is giving you um, all you need to make those rubies and spinels. So how is the aluminum hosted in carbonates? Where was that source of all of these elements? And how did these elements exit in the matrix to actually form those minerals that we're interested in? And how did they actually get to concentrate and make that deposition? So as you know, marble host ruby deposits represent the most important source of coral gemstones from Central and Southeast Asia. And just having that is not enough because if you don't have chromium or titanium, that's going to be colorless and of very little interest. So we both need to know where the aluminum is coming from, but where the chromophores are coming from. And the carbon and oxygen isotopic analysis of the carbonates in the marble show that the marble actually acted as a metamorphic closed fluid system. And so that means that we don't have to infer the presence of an external source that has provided those elements. Um, once again, because these elements were already there. And um, graphite has played a big role because if you actually have a look at the isotopic signal of graphite, um, you can see it had an organic origin, which means that it's basically dead matters uh, that turn into graphite. And in that specimen from Ted Kalchan in, in near Boma in, in Mogok, you get some specks of graphite here. And if you think about that, it means like you basically had dead RGs or maybe not plants because we are more, well, it's not quite the, the right environment for that, but 
mostly dead algae that turn into graphite, and that graphite was a, um, a principal component into reducing the, the proper fluids you needed. So without the plants existing like more than 30 million years ago, you wouldn't have had these. And then if you go in Mogok, sometimes you can find that. That's apatite. That's phosphates. And what's the best sponge for phosphates in Earth? You, I. If you have a look at me, my food intake is very poor in phosphates, except if I'm breaking the phosphoric acid in cola or coke or stuff like this. But otherwise, all my bones, which are made of my teeth, made of appetites, are, are, are phosphate stuff. So basically, having a phosphate source in the marbles means that we've had some vertebrates somewhere that have turned into appetite back again. That's like there, there, there was, there, there is proper studies showing this for the organic matter turning into carbon because I've seen that isotopic ratio. I haven't seen the literature, what I'm telling you about the phosphate source, but if you end up with phosphate in the cal calcite, you need to have phosphate in the first place. And we've seen that it's isochemical reaction. You don't have an external fluid driving in, so you don't have an external source of phosphate. So you need to have phosphate in the first place. Where do you get phosphate in the first place? Skeleton. So it's actually quite exciting because that's dead animal. Um, yeah, um, so there was, a guy who did some more study about the, um, um, the different temperatures in the pegmatites near, uh, near the marbles and the general marbles in Anfu. And um, they, these are always higher than the closure temperature for the dating minerals. Um, so the argon-argon edges that I started discussing about that we found with the phlogopites are actually representing cooling ages and a minimum age for the formation. So the ruby might have formed before. We don't know about that. What we can tell is like, oh, at one point they went so cold that the system was trapped. And from there we can date. We can't date the proper formation. We can date when they cool down. Um, and the uh, oxygen isotopic composition of rubies was birthed by the metamorphic CO2 released during the devolutization of marble. Maybe okay, too technical for that talk. Um, the hydrogen isotopic composition of mica is consistent with the metamorphic origin of water in equilibrium with the mica. So that's actually a sample from um, Mogok. We get a, a phlogopite crystal, and at the core of it, you actually get a spinel, so you get a, a reactive corona of spinel overgrown by uh, by mica, and that mica has some interesting signal when you have a look at the hydrogen isotopic signal. Um, if you go into the fluid inclusion, you're going to notice that instead of the regular CO2 uh, and bromide uh, components, you've got that sulfur present here, both in H2S gas and native sulfur, S8. And that's a really, really weird indication. And um, that's what's making these so special. And the idea to explain how we end up with the fluid having the presence of sulfur in that state, not sulfate, not sulfite, but hydrogen sulfide and uh, elemental native sulfur is that um, We've had a thermal reduction of the evaporate, so sulfate from gypsum or that kind of sulfate bearing source, uh, by the organic matter, the graphite I inferred before. These have actually turned the sulfate into um, the, the reduced sulfur bearing gases and liquids, which were then able to um, interact and mobilize the chromophoric elements. So another indication that we had salt, not just um, sulfates, but also like sodium salts and calcium salts, um, is because you find some um, fluorine, chlorine, boron minerals in the marble too. And that's a very good indicator that you had evaporites, bits and pieces here and there, that are explaining why you get pockets of rubies, pockets of, um, of spinels, because locally, these have been able to 
scavenge the aluminium and the chromophoric chromium and other elements to make those rubies. And that's that's what all the people of Giuliani and Garni and all about is like evaporites are key into understanding the formation of those ruby in marble deposits. Yeah, so the carbonates, calcites, were enriched just a bit in aluminium and chromiferous detriting mineral, such as clay, and those salts um, brought them together. And we still can see the signal of calcium, the remaining sodium, chlorine, and fluorine in the pargazite and edenite, which are these amphibole, very nice looking um, green amphiboles, which are the remnants of those salts part of. That's from looking. So that, um, that's a satellite view of um, the Anfu area, which is like south of Lukien. And basically you can see that you've got a very, very strong structure hosting all of the deposits. So that's the, um, the paddy fields here, the plain where all the secondary material has gathered and is being mined while the rice grows. And all of these are mostly primary deposit, but obviously just at the foothills of the primary deposit you get tiny scale secondary deposits. And um, so you get those lines where you get the, the blue spinel rubies and um, and then regular pink spinels, um, which are kind of obvious. And yeah, it's, it's actually quite continuous uh, formation. Um, and that's the, the mine that we saw in the background um, a few slides ago. Yeah, you, you can see a bit better now how everything aligns. Uh, so these are my personal waypoints of the place I've visited um, and find the literature. Okay, so several reactions are involved in forming the ruby in the marbles, and the principal one is destabilization of spinel in contact with calcites during the retrograde metamorphic path. So when you are cooling down in, in temperature and decreasing pressure, that reaction can occur. And so you get the spinel reacting calcite and CO2 making corundum and dolomite. And so that's uh, the personal sample I've got uh, still in France, where you get all that um, spinel here, which is overgrown by corundum. And you actually have flogopite too. But, and you don't have the remnant of either calcite or dolomite because it's been uh, weathered out. So that's the example of a reverse destabilization, uh, where you actually had uh, local sapphire forms, and it seems to have been reacting with the surrounding dolomites and has created a corona of iron-rich spinel, so hercinite, and then calcite and CO2, and obviously that people have been rolled into the river, so they, there are no carbonates um, left. Um, that's another sample displaying the very same phenomenon. Uh, instead of being a, a white sapphire, local sapphire is now a faint blue sapphire, but the story is the same. You get that reactive corona. Um, and quite rare, so um, I don't think many of you have seen those pictures before. Um, it also happens with ruby. It's quite common to see that in local sapphire and a bit more rare on blue sapphires, but to see that on ruby, that's low definition specimens, uh, pictures, because uh, those are actually not my pictures that were sent for me from Mogok. Uh, I think it's from Mogok on, on both slides. Um, and so Ruby Dolomite on gives uh, iron rich spinels and as night capsite and CO2. Um, sometimes you can even go a step further and have a complete uh, demobilization, um, re reverse destabilization. So in that instance, we started with a, a trappish corundum, which has actually of a decent size because it's a finger here for scale, um, and then was completely transformed back into spinel. So now it's like a trappish spinel, but it's not trappish spinel because it's spinel, it's a trappish sapphire that has been solimorphed in spinel, or retromorphed, or whatever. Um, it's kind of ugly when it's not backlit, but Petrologically quite interesting. Um, when back it. Um, as I was telling you earlier, that's what we're discussing here, the marble hosted gemstones, and in that uh, that convoy range here. Um, 
that's more Nash hosted. And so that's where you get those prepish sapphires, but um, let's not extend too much on that. Even though in this area, you also have bits of nice roasted sapphires, which can be there. So it's like what you draw the boundary between the, the marble deposit and the lithurgies around. Um, so as mentioned before, it's very important to have association of rubies and, um, and mica because then you can actually date. Most of the time we are dating like um, mica inclusion in the rubies. I was surprised I managed to get uh, a phlogopite specimen that had a ruby traps. So it's like the, the reverse story. You can also create rubies by um, removing the aluminium from muscovite and creating feldspar. Uh, doing that formula here. Um, but that, that's not what is illustrated there. Lukian has a very weird um, mica species, which is aspidolite. Um, that might be figured here uh, on one of the spinel. And on, in Mogok, it's much more common to actually find the, the phlogopite, which is the, the, the magnesium bearing mica um, hosted in uh, uh, not calcite marble, magnesite um, marble. So that's actually um, illustrating much better the, that formula where you get uh, potassium feldspar and corundum all together from uh, muscovite because that's a uh, purple purplish pink sapphire on felsic matrix so actually that's a feldspar and this one was from um, the western side of Bolongi, uh, so Mogo, not Mogo. Um, another way of actually creating corundum is if you start with um, a feldspar you uh, no, you start with marguerite which is another uh, another mica and then you can create these under other conditions. And this specimen is actually a mix of both because you still have some of the marguerite remains there. And you've got the color of the, the ruby um, plus rutile and, and, and gothite. But that's another formula that does work. You don't need to start with, uh, with muscovite all the time if you start with Margaret, uh, you can end up with Corundum too. Um, and that's what's figure here, Margaret, Corundum, bits of scapulite and calcite. Uh, and another specimen with uh, larger blades of uh, Margaret. It's been repolished here, it's still looking. Um, yeah, and that's a specimen from uh, Nepal, from Giuliani collection. Uh, photographing Nancy in the research center. Um, so uh, when I show you the specimen later on, we can go back to that slide and actually uh, discuss the different forms um, because you get these in Tabekin and then I've got a few examples of rubies from Mogok that are displaying those phenomena. Um, and uh, the crystals I've got from Mongshu are actually sliced so we can't really see that anymore. Okay, so enough of the hard science stuff. Um, let's go back to uh, traditional mining practices. Um, so that's um, one cobalt spin and mine um, on the side of um, Enfu, um, close to the lake on the other side there. And you can see that this has very limited impact um, because if you have a look at the number of cubic meters of dirt taken out, it's nothing to be compared with the problem mines we have um, here in Australia. So, you know, in, in a few years' time, the, the, the jungle here is going to go back there and then there's going to be plenty of sediment for the, the stuff to grow. So, actually, low scale, low tech is, is quite environmental friendly. It, it can look like a mess when you go there but actually it has a very low impact overall. Um, this has a, a bit bigger impact because there is an underground mine just there. That's the Bolongi uh, tailings and you get the local inhabitants there that are actually crushing the, um, the marble to into even finer bits to release rubies. And because it's done by hand, 
you are not at the risk of crushing a big ruby into tiny small rubies. Um, and actually, a few months after I took that picture, the mine there closed down because of the license expiring. Same story again. And so that means that those villagers had no outputs of rocks from the mine. And then there was um, some incident um, taking place. And eventually, the villagers went directly themselves into the mine and started producing again. Actually, it's quite interesting to shine um, black light on, on those specimens, maybe we'll do that later on, because you can end up with, um, obviously you get the chromium fluorescent from the rubies, but you get um, weird minerals um, showing up. So you get all the sodalite group with um, barylinoite and concrenite and some of these species, even some hawaiian, um, that, in, yeah, that, that are showing up. And I haven't had taken time to take the pictures, but uh, we'll see the rocks afterwards. And um, it's mostly because of um, excess sulfur in the matrix with S2 minus S3 minus that are reacting and giving, us, giving those, those nice um, fluorescent spots. Um, that's borderline because it's not quite marble hosted, but you still have those um, hackmanite, uh, which is tenebrescent and fluorescent, and, and phlogopite here. And you still have that influence of the local granite um, in contact with the marble, so borderline of the torch again, but um, interesting pictures. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so yeah, that's what it looks like in the field. Sometimes you got a uh, parotite, which is actually associated with um, the rubies, and it's definitely the proof that those sulfates that we had from the evaporites have been completely reduced by the graphite and the organic matter and have turned into sulfides. And the iron that was present around has been captured by those sulfides. And so that's why you end up with very low iron rubies, as we saw in the very first graph, because that sulfur has trapped some of the iron. So only chromium is expressed, and that's how you end up with crazy fluorescence of those. <laughs> so I'm still calling these rubies, but we could argue whether it's pink sulfur or not, because it's, it's really pink and very really fluorescent, but they call that ruby, and so would I. Um, yeah, and feel just happy after buying a few, few rocks there. And I'm going to skip this, otherwise it's going to be too long. That's a story about a mine in the 50s that explained how it was to go there. And um, another interesting mineralogical assemblage you get is uh, chondrotites and spinels and um, uh, uh, scapulites and that amphibole phase that hasn't been analyzed yet, and that I'll analyze later on, if I get the, the chance. And that's what the art groups look like uh, in the jungle. And this was on the way to KQ Mine, which is the place where the blue spinels are found. The rubies are the byproducts. And literally 50 meters from there, uh, instead of finding blue spinels in matrix or something, you had that assemblage where uh, clean of mites Okay, so you remember when we discussed the, the government uh, army operating mine in Yadanikalakara and Chukyat at the, the western western port, part of Mogok, that we had like 30 people tops. That's what it looked when I visited the place. So you can see that the villagers actually took over the place and made these their own and were mining this at their profit. And this picture was uh, sent to me a few weeks ago. So you can see that the environmental damage that was done there is kind of non-existing anymore. And that's one year in between those two pictures. Um, Where would they sell the, the stones from that they found? What, what they well, where would they, if the villagers find yeah. rock? Um, crystals, where would they, what would they do with them? Do they sell the crystals to someone that then cuts them? Or what do they do yeah, with them? There is every step of the industry there already. Mm -hmm. and. Most of the time, um, they don't need to find a buyer for a five carat uh, ruby because there are already more buyers than rubies that are being found. 
So it's it's never too much of an issue to set the big stones, which are which are actually fine there. Because when I went back there, I saw much bigger stones than the one I was able to see when the army operated the mine, because there was no filtering of that. Mm. And um, and so it wasn't illegal for them once the government pulled out. It wasn't it, illegal for them to do it. No one had a license. Yeah. Neither the government nor this. Yeah. But there are the villagers which are literally like sort of the satellite pictures. They are living like 200 meters from the mine. Mm. So it's theirs by Historically, it, before there was a government, yeah. Yeah, they were mining this area anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of land rights. Mm. But um, there are actually a few markets where they can sell the stones. One in Chatkin, which is like the, 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 the town on the western side of the Mogok Valley and, 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 and Mogok Market. But because of the recent events, um, none of those markets were really operational because people were more busy actually demonstrating the streets than, um, than mining or trying to sell that. Um, and these actually, these people have a very little need. So uh, a common practice is like, even if I'm offering a good price for a stone, if that person doesn't actually need the money for that they could get from the stone, they might not actually sell it, even though I would be willing to buy in a fair price, just because they've got little needs and it's better to store money in a form of stores, especially when you've seen the curve of inflation I, I showed you, because at least it's going to hold value much better than the bank. These people haven't had access to the bank since February. In, um, I think it was a month and a half ago, the banks reopened and there were like a few hours of queue just so people could um, get 200 bucks. That was the top. Um, actually, the, the, the new the new currency, it would not even be 200 bucks, it would be slightly, slightly less. It's, it's ridiculous. That's all the money they were about to redraw because every, every bank was shut down. Um, so that, that's that's why selling or holding stones is is quite common actually. Is it likely that there would be more illegal selling now because of the government's control? Yeah, there was already seventy percent stuff was done through yes, you, you through, said. through illegal stuff. Yeah. It's, it's what's legal, what's illegal? No, yeah, like, but, but um, yeah. what what wasn't properly recorded, yeah. should I say? These are some recent finds. I haven't been fortunate enough to acquire some because they are already super expensive there. I've, I've seen some uh, David Star spinners loose, but seeing some on Matrix is really, really, really uncommon. Okay, um, I think that's about it. Um, I think it's going to be tea time. So. Um, um, you are all invited to the Perth German Mineral Show um, in less than 90 days now. And yeah, see you there. And I think I'm going to do another talk there on uh, mineral from the Alps, smoky quartz and fluorite and stuff like this. Um, any questions, anyone? Uh, yes. That was a fascinating talk, Nicola. Thanks. Um, I'm I just wonder if it's possible to uh, give the gems from the area provenance based on just based on the um, the traces of elements that are there because you did show that there was a gallium to magnesium ratio that varies between the Yemen and Mogok, for example, and the stones have carbon inclusions and so on. Yeah. So I wondered if because the villages are poor, so I wondered if. Um, it's not about the, um, the wealth of the villages, it's like yeah, as long as you get a, a researcher that has the funds to do the research, then you get the results. Um, and um, so I skipped that, but basically, even even within the, the vicinity of uh, Anfu, there has been some research done to see how that deposit was different from that deposit, from different from um, that deposit. That's the one where I showed you um, the picture and I, and I commented about. Uh, how little impact it had on the environment stuff. Yeah. Um, these blue spinners are different from those blue spinners, are different from those blue spinners, and we can actually track that by checking the zinc, by checking the, the iron content, and the vanadium and stuff, and the nickel. So there is some work being done on that. 
I uh, just didn't want that talk to be too lengthy. But um, I think I could find um, the paper I'm actually mentioning right now, um, if, if you want to have a look at, at this one. And um, maybe I can talk to you afterwards about it. Which, whichever, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Well, what about um, rehabilitation of those mine sites, um, both for the environment but also for safety because you've got a lot of holes going down. Someone else comes along, they don't know where a hole is. Yeah. Um, that's that's the um, different cultures, you know, <laughs> should I say. Um, <laughs> there, there are stories where, um, if, if I go back into, I don't know if I've got the screenshot of, um, yeah, so let's say that that house there, there, that has an owner, and this is actually the bottom of the valley, and this was mined by the English in the 1900s, and they recovered rubies there. But there are also rubies here, and there, and there, and all that gravel was gem bearing. And so if you own the house there, you are your house is actually sitting on top of Chambering <laughs> gravel. And what some people did in the past is like they dug under the house and then they dug under people's house. <laughs> and then uh, the neighbor house starts to be <laughs> tilting a bit. So these kind of incidents all happened. Um, they happened in the past. We've got record of that. And that's, I think that's what I was wanting to share with that uh, story of the guy in the 1950s. He, he was um, discussing this. And at the same time, um, um, rehabilitation. It, there are different scales of mining in um, in Myanmar. You get like those state-owned mines, uh, which are mostly underground. And then, obviously, because you're removing water from inside, you need to store it outside. And then you've got that extension of the dumps and the or the white area I was sh showing you. Um, that doesn't quite get rehabilitated so far, as far as I've seen. Um, but um, because almost businesses here are operated by families, like the most people I've seen was in this area there, and there were like 15. These were like six people here, um, six people. So, and they are only mining these during the, um, the period where they are not busy doing the crops and stuff. So you've got little impacts to start with because you are not removing like, many cubic meters of stuff. Um, and and the vegetation in the jungle is like so powerful. It, right. in, in, in Vietnam, that's one of the places where I've seen the least impact, um, really, because I was I was going to Keiki deposit, which is there. And I went there twice at what it, four months difference, two years ago. And there was a place in between where I told you about the, the purple spinners and chondrotite and stuff. I wanted to go back there the second time. I couldn't find a place. It was from the track. Literally, I mean, I could find a place, but it didn't look like anything, like a place. Banana trees were grown back there because you've moved that sediment and the sediment has like released some more new minerals and stuff. So the vegetation just grows like that. And so humid there that it, it's not much of an issue in, in Lukian. Um, area, I wouldn't say so in, in Burma, but um, I, actually the the lake looks all right now. But um, you, if you were there a century ago, it would have been looking like not like cavalry pits, but like proper mining operation. Mm -hmm. And now it's in the middle of the village, and no one's complaining about that. Um, the the only issue I've heard of and I've seen is. For the west of Mogok, you get um, still active, large open pits, and um, the issue comes from water usage more than slope instability of stuff. Because um, when there is the tailings, there is not always um, a tailing stamp to make the fine decant, and so that's the same water that is then used later on, and so there is a need for filtering, and um, there is a um, battle of usage like I want water you want water and we only have a given supply mm. and do you want to drink or do you want to operate the mines yes. that's that's the issue 
I'm seeing, I, I've seen some reports about some mine collapse in, in Bangkok, uh, no, in Mogok, in Mogok. But if you were actually to have a look at the ratio of the price invested in safety versus the price of a human being, which is a terrible thing to say, I'm not sure that Australia would actually do better. Um, because, you know, when they, they do insurance claims and stuff, there is a price for life. That's how you decide whether you're going to have a roundabout or not. I mean, life is going to save. Uh, life is like three million for uh, French, I think, or something like that. If it's saving one French per year. And if the roundabout costs two million, it's worth making a roundabout. That's how we make decisions in France about roundabouts. If, if you're making this kind of assumption for mine, is it worth like spending 50 million in safety when you're actually going to save one person? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think they are doing that kind of calculation in, in, in Myanmar anyway, because you are the one buying the bamboo, you are the one buying um, the, the electricity for the generator so you can get the, the buckets of, of dirt out. And the less material you remove, the better you are, because you are actually the one mining that. And so there is always a trade-off between safety and the price you're willing to pay. Um. Nicola, I can see that you have lots of specimens up here. I do. Can we, after you've here speaking, can we kind of look at them and yeah. get you to yeah. talk to us about them? And Sure. Yeah. You can start now if you want. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll actually break it. Yeah. Um, but I will, for the talk, thank you so much. It was it was absolutely fascinating. And, <laughs> and the scary thing is that it kept on going, it could have gone more that way and more that way and more this way. And, you know, it's... There are things that I learned today that I had, I just had no concept of, you know, from the very beginning of how things started. It was fabulous. It truly was fabulous. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that you don't forget us here at Gemma House, um, we have got for you one of our presentation bags. <laughs> Thanks. We also have a, um, a keep cup that's got a you know, GAA logo on it and up here. Is that the proper stubby holder? No, well, no, no, no. it might be a wine cup or it might be a coffee cup, okay. but it's insulated. <laughs> and um, there is a wine coast, but there's also a bottle of wine to go with it. Yeah. So no, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. We all do. Thank you. Thank you.